Since I've covered many of the small items that will appear in the parish shops, I'm now going to cover building the structure that houses all of the shops. I have just a few notes before I dive into the details. In terms of covering all of the uh, construction and putting together each little shop, those are going to be in separate videos that will follow this video over the next several weeks. Now I'm using three of the two-story house kits to create the overall shop building. You saw me use one of those in doing the steampunk series. Now since I've covered the basic assembly of this house kit that I'm using, in the previous steampunk video series, I'm only going to cover construction techniques that are different for this project. Now, don't worry if it's too big of a project to tackle, as I'm also going to talk about how you can uh, make individual shops from just room kits. Of course, you could always opt to use just one of the house kits or two of the house kits instead of all three. Um, you'll notice that the building looks like it's under construction, and that is because in future videos, I'll be adding lovely display windows, awnings and doors and more as I cover each individual shop. Now some of the new construction features I'm going to highlight in this tutorial is that um, to add more interest to the row of shops, I'm actually staggering the house kits and I'm recessing the one in the middle and that way the other two on the ends uh, pop out. And then I wanted uh, the height and the style of each of the three structures to vary, which I accomplished by using a new smaller version of the old roof, the roof I used in the uh, steampunk uh, house on each side, on the, on the, uh, each side of the center. And in the middle is a new garden roof and it's a little bit bigger than the other two roofs. So I just get that variation in, in roof style and, and the roof line itself. Um, now, since, the House of Fashion will be occupying multiple rooms on the second floor. I've also cut doorways between the individual houses, and I'll show you how to do that. And um, in the center of the building, there's going to be an elevator because, of course, you need a way to get from the first floor to the second floor. And I'll also cover that in a future video. And then rather than using brick paper, as I did with the steampunk house, I've used a paint technique to give it more of an authentic French style. So I'll be covering that as well. If you're going to use more than one house kit like I did and you want to stagger the, um, the houses, the structures, um, and if you're not going to be moving from room to room where you need openings between each of the buildings, then you can simply put each kit together and then glue them together after you have them assembled. But if you are going to need to cut a hole, whether you stagger it or not, um, what I would do first is before you start assembling the, um, the walls and the structure and the floors and the ceiling, that you go ahead and cut your hole so that your holes will line up. And so the first thing you need to do is to determine which walls are going to have the holes for the doorways and then I found it the easiest to make sure that everything lined up, that I actually glued the walls together that were going to be cut open. And that way I made sure that the two doorways would line up. I was afraid if I cut them independently, then put it together, if it was a little bit off, I'd have a doorway cut in one wall and another wall that didn't meet up. So um, I'll try to like make it clear by looking at this little diagram of the houses put together. As you look at the diagram on the bottom, the uh, oblong boxes represent the front of the building. And the two black boxes are the side house kits and the red box is the center house kit. Now, because I'm putting the boutique on all three floors at the top, I need to cut holes for doors in all of the boxes. So the blue lines that you see are where I'm placing doorways that will go from room to room. And so I need to cut a hole that matches in the interior walls that meet up between the black and the red on both sides. So I need to cut a hole in the side of the black box and then the red box and then again in the other side of the red box and then the other black box. And then if you look at the top, you'll see um, it's a top down view of the four or the excuse me the three houses and again you see that same blue line to just show you from a top perspective where I'm cutting those holes and you also see that the center one is staggered back 
from the other two. Now, it makes it a little bit more complicated to do that. So if you don't want to do that, then you can just make them all line up. But I want to show you that because one of the things that you need to think about if you're staggering it is where you're going to cut your holes because the buildings aren't going to line up. And as you look at the top view of the red one, there's not the whole wall is not available to cut the door because it doesn't meet up as it comes to the front of the building. So I had to find a place in between uh, that little area where the red and the black intersect where I could put my doorways. So the first step is to glue together the interior wall. So you're going to have two sets of those and you want to make sure that you glue them together going the right direction. The straight edge will be the uh, the view of the house from the back when you're looking inside of it and the um, the tongue and groove side of the uh, the wall is where it will assemble uh, to the front of the house. So um, you want to make sure that those are all even and lined up. And if you're going to stagger your walls or your houses, then you'll want to to um, stagger how you glue them together. And then the next step is I made a template out of a piece of chipboard, and I use that to mark where I want the door. And if you, if you look at the image there, one, what you want to be sure of is you see where my lines are drawn. I'm coming, the bottom of the door comes right above the, um, the, the, uh, the grooves there, that was, which is where the floor is going to come in. So the, um, the tongue and groove of the floor will fit into those slots, and you want the door to end just at the top of one of those slots. And then uh, the next step, you would go through and take a, a heavy box cutter and just cut very slowly with a metal ruler through the layers of chipboard until um, the doorway is completely open. And I think here in this picture, you can get a better idea of where I place the door on the walls. And notice, you see where the green arrow is there. I made sure to leave space on the one wall. Uh, and not to get it too close to the edge of that wall. So you do want to make sure that your doorway is not close, too close to the edge of either one of the uh, interior walls. So you'll do that for this interior, and then you'll do it for the next interior wall. It's at this point you also want to cut any other holes that you need. And another set of holes that I cut was to accommodate an elevator. And I cut a four and a half by four and a half inch hole in the floor of the second story um, center house where the boutique will be. Um, so I cut a hole there and it was four and a half by four and a half. And then to um, open up the ceiling as well for two reasons, one for the elevator, but also I wanted to make the ceiling above that's right underneath the uh, garden roof as open as possible to get as much light in as possible. And so that hole I cut uh, seven by six. So any kind of other holes that you want to accommodate anything, you need to go ahead and cut them now at this point uh, before you assemble any of the, the floors or ceilings or walls or anything like that. The other thing you should think about is lighting. And if you remember back to the steampunk, I added chandelier to the second floor. Well, I'm gonna be doing that as well. So um, on the second story on each side of the center, the other two boutique rooms that fl that flank uh, where the elevator will be in the center, I uh, added a hole in the top of that ceiling so that I can um, accommodate putting a chandelier with lighting through there. And all the mechanism for that will be underneath the roofs on the top. And I don't, I'm not going to glue the roofs down again, just like I did with the steampunk one so that I can get access to that lighting. So again, at this point, before you do anything else, you need to go ahead and add any holes that you think you'll need for lighting. Once you have all the holes cut, now you can begin to add any paint or paper to the interior. Um, that's what I did with the steampunk house. And I will put a link down in the description area for that tutorial in case you haven't seen it because it does cover all of the assembly in, in great detail. So I'm not going to cover that here, but uh, I papered the, the, the inside walls, the floors, the ceilings, pretty much everything. And then I also framed out the doors and the other holes that I cut because it was just so much easier to do all that 
when the uh, walls and floors and all are put together and you're trying to climb in there with your hands and, and, and uh, frame all that stuff out. Now all of the framing that I use and some of the tile work that I use uh, on the floors and the ceilings and the moldings, trims on the inside and the outside all come from the uh, architectural uh, digital kit. And it's the same kit that I used when I did the steampunk house and there's just loaded with stuff. And so I've used um, a lot of the images on that, the, the tile images, the different trims and uh, window frames and things like that. I've used that for both the inside and the outside of, of these shops. At this point now, I have glued together all the walls and ceilings, and I'm just gonna walk through each one of the rooms with you just to point out some, uh, some details. The first one you see here is the room that's going to be the chocolatier. And I've used scrapbook paper on all the walls and the floor and the ceiling. I pieced together tiles from the digital kit. And then the next room that you see will be the florist, and that's where the elevator will be. It will be sitting down there and then pulled up through the holes. And again, I've used scrapbook paper on the walls, on the ceiling, and then again, use tile, and I mix them up, the white and the, and the green on the floors. And then, of course, you can see on this one, uh, it's not closed in. The wall isn't closed in in the front. Uh, you do have a doorway and windows. And then if we go to the next one, that is going to be the cafe. And all of the walls and ceilings are all scrapbook paper. And then all the trims that you're seeing, the moldings on the floors, on the corners, at the top of all of these rooms come from that digital kit. And then upstairs, here's a sample. This is just one of the rooms. They all look the same. All the way across the top is the boutique. And again, scrapbook paper on the walls, on the ceiling, and on the floor, the, uh, the uh, wood that you see is a free collage sheet that I have for you on my blog that you can download. And I created this to coordinate with the papers I'm using in the boutique. And of course, for all of these supplies, all the different papers that I use, rather than going through all of those, uh, they will be in the detailed supply list on my blog post that goes along with this video. So you can look at those and see what I used and see what you like. Another thing that I'll mention about two of the rooms downstairs, the one that is for the uh, chocolatier and the one that's for the cafe, you notice that it was all walls and the front wall typically has a door and windows. Um, the kit comes that way with uh, doors and windows cut open in the front, but I'm not using those doors and windows. And you might remember that early on, I, um, I talked about adding some uh, really lovely uh, uh, box windows and whatnot, display windows. And so what I've done is I've opted to close those off in favor of having the box windows in the front on those two sides. And when I put that paper up, I first put up a piece of chipboard thin piece of chipboard and then the paper. And the reason I did that is I just wanted to give that wall a little bit more support. I was afraid paper would just be too thin by itself. And then as I was doing the paint treatment, it also protected um, the paper from uh, any of the liquid of the paint and whatnot seeping in and getting to the paper on the inside. So I'm gonna demonstrate the paint technique on just a piece of chipboard so that's easier to see. And I just, just, it was just a regular place, a piece of chipboard that I first sealed with Mod Podge. And the reason I did that is because I'm going to be applying some very watery paint and I did not want it to seep into the chipboard and end up warping it. So this was just a way of just sealing everything and then I didn't have to worry about that. So I did the entire exterior with that and then I painted everything white. And the reason I did that is one, just to block out the the color of the chipboard, but also in all the joins where the chipboard pieces come together, the edges of the chipboard are a different color than the uh, front or the, the surface of the chipboard. So if you if you don't do something to block it all out, you're going to see that difference come through in the paint colors. And then next thing I did was I coated it with the first layer of paint and I used this here. It's a folk art paint and it's acrylic and it's called Buttercup. So it's just a buttery yellow color. And so that's my first base layer. And now I'm gonna start applying layer on top of layer of very, very watery paint. And here, I want you to see this. I've got, you can see how watery this is. I've got some paint in there and I added a bunch of water to it. And this happens to be, uh, they don't make these anymore, this, this brand anyway, it's, it's making memories. It's also called Buttercup. Um, 
but it's just a lighter it's a lighter um, a lighter color uh, of the yellow so what you just basically want is two colors that one is lighter than the other and then I'm going to come in with a paper towel and I'm going to get some of this watery paint on my paper towel now if you're concerned you have too much just you know dab it off somewhere and then I'm just going to come in and lightly tap onto this paint now I also keep a wet paper towel next to me so that way if for some reason I need to lift some of this off it's too much looks like I got my cat hair in there and um, I can come in with the water and very quickly just wipe it off so I'm just going to come in and get some more and I two fingers I'm just tapping and then if I feel like I'm getting too much of a funny pattern I'll just come in and just go like that and just pull a little bit of the paint off and then also kind of change the pattern a little bit of what I'm putting on so I just keep doing that until I get enough on now I don't want to cover up all of the other yellow I just want to um, add this as another layer of paint and the nice thing about it being very watery is that you do get some transparency with the first layer of paint. I don't know where I'm getting all this yucky stuff. Um, you do get that, and you do have that opportunity just to pick some of it up if you think you've got too much. And of course, you know, if I if I got too much of this on and I was like, oh gosh, I should have left more of the dark yellow, just do the same technique with the dark yellow and, and put some of the dark yellow back. So I just keep doing this until I'm happy with what I have. And of course, if you get the end of this and you hate it, then you just paint all over again and start. I mean, I would suggest, unless you feel very comfortable, just doing it on a piece of chipboard like this and make sure that you got what you want. So that way you're not painting a whole bunch of stuff on the, um, the actual house and then you're not liking it. So I'm just gonna let that set and dry and I'll come back and do the next layer. The next color I'm going in with is much darker and it is Americana paint, uh, acrylic paint, and it's called Traditional Raw Sienna. And I've done the same thing where I have mixed up some paint, um, very thin watery paint. This one you want to be a little bit more careful of since I'm adding a dark color. I don't want to go crazy with that. And I, I forgot to mention to you, I also uh, get my paper towel wet ahead of time just to make sure it's wet enough and this might be one of those ones where you just kind of off the side dab it and just make sure you understand how much you're getting on this and I'm just doing the same thing I've been doing except I'm working with much thinner paint because of the darkness and then I'll come in here and just blend it a little bit and pull a little bit, a little bit of it up And hopefully you can see how the color's changing. Now let me show you. If I come in with my rag, I just wipe it a little bit. It'll smooth it out a little bit. So let's say that I thought I had too much on there. I really would like a little bit less of that. And I'll come back in with my lighter yellow and just lay it on top a little bit and just knock back anything that I think is too dark. And you don't want puddles of water. So. I kind of just, it was fine the way it was. I liked it. I just wanted to show you. And I'm just going to keep on going all the way across here. And now I've got, um, I don't know how well you can see it on the camera, but um, I think you can see it from the photographs. I'm now getting that blend of, of three different kinds of yellows. I and mean, I've got the darker color as well. So I'm going to finish this and then uh, let that dry and I'll come back for the last and fourth color. Now I'm ready for the final color. It's going to be gray. And if you don't 
want to do this, you, you like the buttery color and you don't want to go any further, that's fine. You don't need to. I just decided to put the gray in because I was always looking at it. I have a lot of gray accents in the house and between the roofs and the trim and, and uh, the balcony uh, area. So I decided I just wanted a little bit of a hint of gray in there. And this gray is called Zinc from Americana Paints. And then um, I'm definitely have my wet rag next to me because I probably will need to pull some of this up because even more than the raw sienna, I have to be really careful that I don't get too much on there. And I'm just going to tap a little bit of it off and then I'm going to come in and just start adding a little bit of gray. And then before it gets dry, I might come in here, pull a little bit off because I just want to see hints of it in the paint. You can take your time with this. As long as it's wet, you know, you can move it, you can remove it, you can do what you want. So I'm, I'm not trying to significantly change the yellow, I'm just wanting that little bitty hint of gray in there. And hopefully you will be able to see this on the camera, but I think you can certainly see it in the photograph because it's very subtle. Maybe just a hair more. And hopefully you can start to see the difference between the two sides here. And I think it just adds a little bit of depth to it if, if you have a little bit of a different color that's not, you know, in the yellow family. I think it just makes it a little bit interesting. You could have added a, you wanted to continue to go darker, but you didn't want to go with gray. You could certainly bring in a brown, another brown, you know, something in between the, the sienna, which is more of a red, yellowish color. So there you have it. I think that looks pretty decent. And don't worry if you get spots and flecks and stuff like that because that's the way it is. As long as it's not dirt or something like that or cat hair like I had in there, um, it looks fine because that's the way the paint on buildings looks. And I think this would work probably either like the French that I'm doing or it's, it certainly would be a Tuscan look as well. Now the way I approached actually painting the building is I painted one surface at a time, the entire surface, and did all the layers and then moved to the next one. And... Um, I didn't have to worry about the corners of things where things met because uh, I'll, I, um, I'll go through covering how I ended up doing my edges. So it really didn't matter if, if it was a little lighter, darker, or you kind of saw a line where the two met. So I think I just started on one side, did it, and then just kept moving around the building to the other side. So there it is. That's the paint technique. Once all the paint was dry, I then added the trim work. And starting from the top, that top piece is from the digital kit. And then the middle piece is also from the digital kit, but it's the same molding at the top. It's just I cut away the decorative part. So that way it's a thinner molding, but it completely matches what's on the top because it's the top part of the top trim. And then the base trim and the bottom stonework. Now that is not in the digital kit, but I do have that stonework for you on my blog. So you can download that and use that if you'd like to. Now, once I had all the trim in place, then I um, started to do the corners and I did the outside corners as well as the inside corners um, of all of the houses. And the way I did that is I used uh, the brick scrapbook paper and I just cut the little bricks out and there's already a longer brick and a shorter brick in on the paper. So I just cut it out exactly like it was and then uh, glued them on the corners of the buildings. And I just think that really dresses up a building in the steampunk one I did, stone on the corner. So this time I thought, well, I'll just do brick on all the corner. So I think that makes it uh, look really fancy. And you might notice too on the trim in the middle, I didn't do it all the way across on the two end houses. And that's just because there's gonna be a big window there and you're not gonna see it anyway. Now the center section is the only section with windows, um, the small windows and a door. And then of course the second floor is all of the balcony windows and uh, the, the scroll work balconies. You saw me put those together in the other tutorial. Um, basically just color scheme wise, I painted the, uh, the balcony itself a dark gray, then um, 
the back trim was a dark gray same color and then I did a kind of a creamy color or almost white color for the doors themselves and uh, the other archway and behind the doors and also the small windows down below I used um, a plastic that's made for to look like a faux, faux glass and so the same stuff I've used in the past many times. So that's behind each of the windows. And then down below, I've painted all the trim work green, a hunter green. And I don't know if it come, it looks kind of dark in the picture, um, but it is a hunter green. And then uh, the trim on the top of it's white. Now for the door, the kit comes with a door. And there is scroll work at the top part, but I decided to uh, not worry about that this time because I did some stained glass stuff with it last time, filling it in and whatnot with the glossy accents. This time I printed a image of a stained glass on transparency film and then mounted that on white paper so that the uh, it blocked out what was behind it and it really makes those colors pop. I did not emboss it, I just printed it and put it on the paper and then I used this little uh, fretwork screen. You saw me use this as an actual screen before and this time I'm using it as a door so that way you can look through it. And I, again, used um, some of that glass, the faux glass plastic, and I actually have uh, two of those fretwork uh, panels glued together with the plastic in between. And then that's uh, glued in place for the door. And there's a cute little um, handle and then a couple of little hinges on that. At various places on the building, you'll see what looks like stone accent pieces and they're above the doors and windows and you can also see larger versions on um, flanking each side of the balconies and there are also some in the decorative trim work on the top of the two side roofs. Um, those were made using the mold that you see there. It's got lots of really great uh, decorative elements on it and so I ended up using uh, polymer clay. You could use paper clay as well, either, either one, whatever you feel comfortable with. Now I will say with this particular mold, it is difficult to get the clay out of the mold without damaging the clay, without uh, getting it misshapen or something like that. And so. I would suggest if you're using polymer clay, then bake it in the mold. If you're using paper clay, let the paper clay dry in the mold or almost completely dry in the mold. Otherwise, you'll find even with the simpler pieces, you try to bend the mold, which is typically what I do, and try to pop it out. And I just had no luck doing that at all. Now, to get the stone look, um, I went through a series of uh, painting different shades of gray. And if you look to the upper uh, left-hand corner, that's where I started. So I painted everything black. And then I took the black paint and I added a little bit of white to it to make it a little lighter so it became a dark gray and you see that in the picture next to it on the upper right. Then I added a little bit more white to the, to the, to the uh, paint and made it an even lighter gray. And then you can see the next one um, on the bottom left. And then finally one more shade lighter and you see the final product. Now I used a little stencil brush to do this and so I just got a little bit of the paint on my on my brush and I just tapped it, pounced it onto the piece, trying not to completely cover up the colors that came before it. And so then you can see the end result is, is a, a layered, it gave, gives it a lot of depth, uh, a piece that looks like it's stonework. I've used two different style roofs and the one is a solid roof. It looks very much like the one I used in the steampunk house. The difference is that it is shorter. It's not quite as tall. And I think I mentioned in the beginning, I wanted to not only have different style roofs, but I wanted to have different heights just to give the whole look of the building, make it more interesting looking. And I thought, well, I'm gonna go ahead and jazz this up a little bit to make it look a little fancier. And so what I ended up doing is cutting thin pieces of chipboard. And um, you can see in the, uh, the first picture to to the uh, right, the top right, I've put strips of the, the chipboard on there. And then I've come back in with an even smaller, thinner strip of chipboard to go in the middle of that. And I've done that all the way around the roof. And then I also did a thin strip of chipboard at the very top to, to kind of frame it out. And then once I got all that glued together, then I went ahead and painted it. Now I spray painted this roof just to make it easier. I painted it first with a very dark navy gray 
and then I came back in and lightly sprayed it with some gray. And I don't know that you can see it that well on the picture, but there is a variation in the color. And I thought that looked a little bit more interesting rather than just having it totally flat, totally blue or totally gray. And I did notice when I was looking at roofs, um, French roofs and stuff like that, I, I noticed that they did uh, use blue in their roofs and, and a blue gray in, a, in their roofs. And so that's where that came from. Now, in terms of the decoration on the top, I used the little trim work that you see there. Um, I put that all around the edge and I used um, gilder's paste, the, uh, the copper gilder's paste, and rubbed that on top of it. So I took the raw, the raw trim, I painted it black, and then with my finger rubbed on the copper and then um, attached that around the top. And then you'll notice you see the same little uh, clay architectural pieces that I used above the doors you will see that I've used them also uh, around the center of each side of the roof. And partly because I thought that looked better and partly because um, when I used the trim, it didn't, when I cut it to fit it around, it didn't quite meet in the middle. So that kind of forced me to do something, but then I think it worked out the best because I think I like how that looks better. Now the center roof, the garden roof is a brand new roof and it's exactly like the roof I used when I built a conservatory a long time ago. Uh, several years ago um, the tutorials on my blog and um, but it's a smaller version and it's sized for this kit and it comes with four sides and the top and it goes together exactly the same as the solid roof does it's just got all these openings cut in it and um, I use the same faux glass uh, behind all of the panels and the top and then you'll notice as you look at all the pictures of the roofs um, you'll see this tile underneath and that's just a tile image is image from the architectural digi digital kit. And I just thought that looked a little prettier than just painting the top of the roof. And especially since you can see down from the top down into the rooms below. So I thought that looked a little prettier. And then now you can just see all the, um, all the roofs together with the different styles and the different heights. And I think I mentioned it earlier, I'm not gluing these roofs in place because I'm going to need to be able to lift them up and get to things like lighting and the elevator and that sort of thing. Now, if building something this big seems overwhelming to you, of course, you could always just do one building or two buildings. But in addition, if you're just interested in one particular shop or maybe two shops, um, Alpha Stance carries a bunch of just room boxes, just single room boxes that you could use to create any of the shops that I'm, I'm showing you. And they have various styles and a lot of the different architectural things will work with these boxes. So. Um, that's also an option for you if, if you want to do this, but you just don't want to uh, work on something as large or as involved. That wraps up this segment. For more details, hop over to my blog. The link is below in the description area. You'll find the free images, the free uh, floor collage sheet, the stonework, and the stained glass for the door. You'll also, of course, find the detailed supply list and pictures. And um, I've also included the link to the first steampunk uh, house video if you want more details on how to assemble the kit and also if you want other ideas. Then uh, next we're going to go to the Chocolatier and it's going to reside at the bottom left part of the building and I'm going to be transforming it, the front, bringing it to life with display windows and awnings and all kinds of signage as well as the, the shop that's actually inside. So I'll be back in two weeks with that.